thumbnails, moments, uh, branching, and log correlation. And if you have questions, maybe put it in the chat so we don't interrupt, um, and then we can discuss afterwards. Okay, so you can start, Emma. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, if uh, yeah, I'm very bad at monitoring chat, so uh, someone will have to do that for me. Yeah, uh, thank you. Very, oh, thank you, Ivan. Um, yeah, thanks very much. I'm really pleased to be able to be speaking. Uh, I'm still in the UK at the moment, um, and I'll hopefully be over at CUNY at some point uh, next year. But yeah, currently still at Bristol. So uh, also, I'm uh, very wildly ambitious with my Titan abstract a few weeks ago, so I really will say very little about L functions and focus really mostly on characteristic polynomials, the moments in the branching part of this talk. Right, so let's get moving. So um, there's recently been a, a huge amount of interest in understanding uh, logarithmically correlated processes, partition functions of them, and one way of understanding them is via their moments, so that's what I'm going to focus on today. But before I uh, examine uh, that too much further, uh, let me set out some notation. So uh, what I want to be bearing in mind for uh, the majority of this, uh, this talk is this sort of canonical model. So here I've, I've given you a uh, binary tree of depth four. So depth is going to be uh, the, uh, the um, number of levels in my tree here. Uh, and then I have a root node at the top and I have uh, some leaves at the bottom. And you'll see that for a depth n tree, I have two to the n leaves. So that's what I've written on the left hand side here. Now I want to load to every branch a, a centered Gaussian random variable, these, these y variables, they're all IID and they have this particular variance. And I'll try and motivate that a bit more later on in the talk. You'll also notice that these y variables, are, and notationally I've identified this m and l, so this l is going to be a leaf and this m is going to be some level in the tree, but there's no dependence on that in the distribution of my random variable at all, but it will be no, important notationally later, so I'll retain that for the time being. And so I've depicted these, for an example, leaf, i.e. This, this far right leaf here, uh, this is the path from root to leaf, and these are the random variables you pick up along the way. So then the branching random walk from the root node down to leaf L is going to be given by this X of N of L, so the depth N and the leaf L. And it's just the, the sum, uh, as you naturally expect, of these random variables, these Y random variables. An immediate uh, thing we can note is that the distribution of X is going to again be a centered Gaussian, but with this particular variance, which is half log of the number of leaves is two to the M, so I've absorbed the M into the log here. And the other comment I want to quickly make is that if I take two leaves, you'll notice that the, the random walks down to the leaves cannot be independent unless I take a particular choice of leaf. So for example, if I take this neighbor leaf here, the path is completely joined up until this, this node here where it diverges. So there's some um, dependence between the leaves uh, depending on uh, for the random walk. Okay. So uh, I said at the, the top, this is uh, a canonical model for this sort of class of logarithmically correlated processes. So how can we see this is log correlated? Well, one way of seeing uh, that is by uh, examining the covariance. So here are these x of n's are my random walk and these for, for two identified leaves L and L prime, let's let them not be the same. Uh, otherwise, that would just be the variance. So looking at the covariance here, which we can compute such as this, and then I say it's exactly equal to this object here. And what is that? Well, you'll see if we move over to the picture on the right hand side, if I identify these two leaves L and L prime given by these yellow and red nodes at the bottom of my tree, well, this LCA, which is stands for the last common ancestor of the two leaves, is going to be the, further, the deepest point in the tree up into which the paths down to those leaves split. So you can see if I take the path down to the leaf, I'm allowed to share the branch up until this point at which I have to diverge. So this will be the last one ancestor who lives at level one here in my tree. And you'll see that thereafter my warts are completely independent. They'll split, these are centered Gaussians, and so I receive no contribution thereafter. So I really only receive a contribution up until the last common ancestor. 
And you can actually see this sort of log correlation by embedding the tree in this unit interval. So as I've done here, I've embedded it here, and these leaves are now sort of equally spaced points within this interval. And you can actually calculate that essentially the, the level of the last common ancestor of the two leaves is effectively this log base two of the, of the reciprocal of the distance between the leaves. And so uh, this is completely characteristic of a log logarithmically correlated process. There's some dependence between how close the points are, and you get a logarithmic, logarithmic singularity when the points get close. And so this, this behavior here is, is very indicative of a log correlated process. Okay, so uh, that was the canonical model. Uh, let's talk about something else. So here's one from random matrix theory. So if you take a uh, unitary matrix A, so recall this is one whose inverse is its conjugate transpose, and then take its characteristic polynomial, which I've written here, then again, you can do a, a covariance calculation. And it turns out that instead of just calculating the covariance of the characteristic polynomial, the right thing to calculate is the real part of the log of the characteristic polynomial. And that's a sensible thing to do in the sense of this logarithmically correlated processes framework that I, I'm living in. So once you do that, and so we're calculating at two different points, and so these points are living on the unit circle and the complex plane, because that's where the eigenvalues of this matrix line. So I identify two points on, on this arc, and uh, the covariance is going to depend exactly on how far apart these two arc points are. So if they're far, so they're apart, they, they live distinctly on this arc in, in, in this sense, then we get a logarithmic uh, singularity occurring, which is, as I said before, indicative of, of one of these logarithmically correlated processes. However, my two points lie really close, and I'm comparing this to the branching model, this is like saying I'm walking to the same leaf. So if these lie really close, I am walking to the same leaf, what am I going to get? I get to go all the way down the tree. And so I pick up just the variance. So it's essentially like identifying these two as the same leaf. This is exactly why I chose that variance at the start for my branch weightings, which is like log two, because that meant my random walk had one half log of the number of points. And this is the, the right variance to take in the random matrix setting. So my matrix size is going to, in this analogy, going to look like the number of points on my uh, binary tree. So capital N is like two to the little n. Okay, and my one phrase uh, for, for towards L functions is that you can do a similar thing for, for L functions. So log of, the real part of the log of, of zeta on its critical axis also demonstrates a similar behavior. Okay, so moving onwards to partition functions. So for this left-hand column is for branching random walk and the right-hand column is for random matrix theory. So for branching random walk, the, the partition function or moment generating function, depending on, on your, your perspective, uh, is written as the following. So, so here we exponentiate our process, our log correlated process, which was our, our walk down our binary tree. Uh, and this is the partition function. Um, and then, as I said, one way of examining the partition function is to study its moments. And so such moments are gonna denote by this M and identify branching random walk. And now I have two parameters, a beta coming from the partition function and a K coming from which moment I'm taking. So I'm now averaging over the, the Gaussian behavior of this, this random variable. On the random matrix side, what do we do? Well, as I said, they, they both have this underpinning, underpinning log logarithmically correlated structure. And so I want to do a similar calculation. So here's the analogous partition function. I'm exponentiating the log correlated process, my real part of my log, and I'm now averaging around the circle, which is the equivalent of averaging over leaves here. And then again, I can take the, the moment of the partition function, which I'm now differentiating by random matrix in the notation. And so now this expectation is averaging over matrices. So I'm averaging over the matrix group. We can do this. The unitary group is a compact Lie group. So we have a Haar measure, and that's the measure of it against which I'm averaging here. So uh, we're now handed two different moments, the moments of a partition function for branching random walks and one for random matrix theory, unitary random matrix theory. So what can we say about them? Well, um, remember, so at the bottom, I always want to be comparing my matrix size N with the number of leaves of my tree. So uh, we can show that, so K was my, uh, my moment parameter here, and beta was my partition function parameter. 
So for branching, this is my branching moments here. So for my moment parameter being an integer, my branch, my partition function parameter uh, being a real number. So I exclude zero, it's a trivial case. So for anything non-zero, we have something non-trivial. We can analyze this asymptotically. Asymptotically here is gonna be as my tree gets deeper and deeper. So my, my N, my depth of my tree uh, is growing. And so we actually get three different regimes of behavior. And, it, and uh, from another different perspective, from a statistical mechanics perspective, this is actually completely predictive. This is not surprising necessarily, but I, I won't say anything more about that for, for the, due to lack of time, but, but let me just say this is, this is anticipated, the behaviors we get here. So we get three different regimes of behavior depending on where my parameters lay. Okay, so that was the branching case. What about the, the less canonical, this random matrix case, which still should exhibit this, some logarithmic correlation. So there's some uh, relationship between the two here is what I'm arguing. Well, what we can show well, for, for the moment parameter K being an integer, and we have to restrict our, our partition function parameter a lot more. This is a much harder problem. So we should be able to do less sort of uh, philosophically. But we can still analyze these moments of partition functions asymptotically. Asymptotically now means as the matrix size gets large, as we get some other leading order coefficient, which again, I'm not, not describing, I'll, I'll hide them for, um, for cleanness, but we get a leading order behavior uh, in our matrix size N like this. And now you'll see that when uh, K and beta are integers, which is prescribed by this theorem, we have to land in this third regime here. And so these are the two things you should compare. And once you compare the number of leaves to the matrix size, you see exactly these, it's sort of the same asymptotic, uh, uh, asymptotic behavior um, in large matrix size or large tree size. So this is adding even more weight to the idea uh, that there's some underpinning structure, uh, something really interesting going on uh, canonically here. And it's all down to like this logarithmic correlated structure that's underpinning the, the whole system. Um, and again, let me say in my, my last few seconds, uh, what I've described here, you can do similar things theoretically for, for number theoretic functions in particular for, for the Riemann zeta function as well. So I'll leave it there. I don't want to be cut off. So uh, all of my uh, results I've just said here are contained in, in these archive links. And I'm happy to answer questions over email in chats or, or right now if we have time. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. That's wonderful. Um, so let's, in the interest of staying on time, if people have questions, they can ask them now. But let's transition the slides over to the next talk, which is Michelle Penn. Um, and and you know you can also get in touch with people afterwards uh, or we will have a, a tea break after the four talks what we'll do as far as clapping is at the end of the set of four we can uh, unmute everyone and we can all uh, applaud all of the different speakers uh, so you let's stop